everyone. Thanks so much for joining me today at Talks at Google. This is a very special session as we celebrate Black History Month. I'm Amber, I work at Google Cloud, and I'll be your host today as we have a very, very special guest. He's a chef with 13 restaurants around the world, including Harlem's Red Rooster. You may have seen him on shows like Top Chef Masters and No Passport Required. He's been the guest chef for the White House during the Obama administration, and he is the best-selling author of eight books, including one that we're gonna talk about today, The Rise, Black Cooks and the Soul of American Food. I'm so honored and so excited to welcome the one, the only Marcus Samuelson. But before I bring him up, I'm going to start off asking him a couple of questions and then we wanna hear from you, everyone who's tuning in at home. So definitely feel free to drop any questions you have into the live chat to the right. But without further ado, let me definitely welcome Marcus. Hi, Marcus. Hey, Amber, how are you? I'm good, I'm good, how are you doing? I'm glad um, to be here. It's uh, I'm right now in Miami in Overtown, a restaurant here, and uh, you know it's it's uh, just good times to really think about the privileges that we have and navigating through this very challenging time and just reflect a little bit, you know. Absolutely. And Miami is such a beautiful city. I love visiting there when I can. Definitely love the beaches. Uh, before we get in, though, I'm so excited to have a conversation. But this is not the first, second, or third time you've been at Google. This is actually the fourth time that you're talking with us. So that's very special. You must like us a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been many times in Mountain View and also, of course, to New York. And it's always, there's always, what I love about it is it's, a, it's just constantly moving, right? And you learn something. You give something, but you also take away something, and you always learn. And I'm always a, um, impressed by the staff curiosity, you know, whether it's to cooking and involving the food experience that uh, is happening on campus, but also the curiosity to, you know, in terms of pl platform building and connecting us. Yes. Well, I'm glad we could connect today. And I feel like we have a lot to talk about with the rise. Uh, so I picked up a copy, but for those who might not have just yet, what exactly is it all about in your own words? The rise is really an opportunity to A, acknowledge black excellence when it comes to food and showing that our diversity, right? As black people, we know that we are diverse, but I think the single biggest misunderstanding about black food is its diversity. And um, that really goes back to, there hasn't been enough storytelling and content shared about uh, black excellence so I wanted to acknowledge the authorship of American food and black food. I want, if you acknowledge the authorship, it's very, right away you see that black experience have contributed so much to American food. Second, if you have the right authorship, you can now have correct memories. You know, once we build memories correctly, you can then also then build aspirations. So authorship, um, really memories and aspirations are linked to me when it comes to black experience and black excellence. And in America, we've learned so much about Italian food or Spanish food or French food. We should learn more about black cooking in America. Yeah, and not only are there recipes as well, but you do have little tidbits about, for example, where some of the spices or where some of the foods come from as well. And you also have these beautiful stories uh, from different chefs and writers from around the world, really. Uh, I was researching and saw in an interview you did, it took about, I think, was it four years to put the cookbook together? Yeah. Yeah, I'm slow, man. You know, for me, I want to make sure that when you do a book like this, when you have the privilege to tell a story like this, take your time. And because it's really within the stories, there lies the complexity, the deliciousness and the beauty, right? You can be African-American and the food context around that, the way our vice president, being both Asian-American and African-American. And of course, we know that, but a lot of people don't understand how that's possible. But guess what? Naisha Arrington in Los Angeles, she's Korean American and African American. So her food is of those culture. Or someone like 
Greg Godet in down the street from you guys in, in, in Portland, you know, is Haitian American but lives you know, on the West Coast, so obviously takes those influences. My journey being from Ethiopia, living in New York. So blackness is vast, is layered and complex. And when you think about European narrative, it's layered and complex as well. But those stories have been told through trading, through tourism, through aspirational content in either videos or, or magazines. When it comes to black cooking, we haven't shared the same amount of information. Therefore, it's murkier. Yeah, but you're definitely sharing a lot of stories from some phenomenal uh, chefs and cooks and uh, just contributors to the uh, culinary industry. So it's been fantastic to read the stories. Uh, but the ride also isn't, it's not just a cookbook. I, I know that it's also a show in collaboration with Uber Eats. So was that always the idea to have that show complement the cookbook or, or how did that come about as well? I mean, for me, it's about aspirations, right? When I started, when I started Red Rooster, for you as a customer, it's the experience of going there, but for the staff, it's a learning center and the next generation of black hospitality folks come out of that, right? So I always think about what do I put into something? What's going to come out of it, right? So that's generational wealth of knowledge can come out of if you build it strong, right? And in terms of the rise, that show is so important because we also raise money for specifically black businesses in America at this moment, right? So we started a fund called Black Business Matters Matching Fund, right? So being able to not give loans, but to give grants to small family businesses in the black space at this moment is super, super key, right? Uh, the next step that's going to come out of this, we're going to build a residence program out of the rise so we can uplift one black chef to go away for six weeks to study and then come back and tell us her or his experience. So residence experience is a given when it comes to the art world, even in the music world, but not in the cooking world. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's important to, the things that I've been exposed to and beyond, I wanna now give back where that's, where sometimes that could be grants, sometimes that could be in a direct opportunity, and sometimes that could be in a residence program. Awesome. I can't wait to hear more about those ventures. That sounds really exciting and definitely very meaningful and impactful. Uh, so I want to dive a little bit too into the book and its content because, like I said, I feel like there's not just all these amazing recipes, but you have these very thoughtful stories as well. Um, but I know there's about five chapters or so, and you start out talking about the future of food of the Black diaspora. Why did you decide to start there rather than, you know, where we've been before, where we are now? Well, I think the way the book is laid out, I, I think I start uh, with who got next because I wanted to be very optimistic. And here are some of the most incredible people. You know, Patricia Gonzalez was 17 when we started the book. Or, you know, I, I, I know black cooking in America will be vibrant and delicious for generations because there is so much talent out there. So then it's for someone like myself, it really the job is to broadcast that and bring that in. And black food doesn't necessarily only live in restaurants. It can live um, on YouTube. It can live through pop-ups. It can live through so many different experiences, like so many things in black culture, right? It doesn't always live in the four walls experiences, right? Think about hip hop, how it started as basically essentially park parties, right, and underground, and then now it become, it is pop culture, it is what America defines as pop culture, it is hip hop. Yeah, and where are you seeing some of these really exciting new culinary trends pop up as well, if not just in restaurants, what other places? Well, I think we're in a very, we have a, we're at a very pivotal moment in entrepreneurship in America, right, that's gonna be hit, that's gonna be the industries that will, navigate through this difficult time and do very, very well. But for craft people and for people that connect on traditional store and in, in four walls experiences, this is very difficult. Yeah. But 
I think you can also argue that black people have been going through different types of pandemics before. And yet the brilliance comes out of that, right? Out of the worst times in the 70s and 80s comes hip hop. Out of the worst times in the 60s, civil rights movement, all of that stuff comes incredible music. So I do think food is similar, right? Um, street food, street experiences, having pop-up parties, having versions of restaurants happening, um, host times like, you know, like COVID can also uh, be the most interesting. You know, I think that there's less game change, there, there's less gatekeepers today. Before you think about cooking, it's a very traditional field where the gatekeeper was the local big newspaper and maybe even, let's say that, local magazine that maybe reviewed you once or twice. But those are not the experiences black people live in. You know, we don't have gener we didn't have generational wealth. We couldn't we were blocked from borrowing money from the local institutions. So but that didn't keep us from cooking. Right? So I I think now it's a time when we can broad broadcast that through social media in a completely different way. So the next generation of storytellers in food is you experience them right now. Yeah, and I think one thing also that really stuck out to me in your book was that you have a section of resources, right? So that readers can check out the different chefs and follow them or just all of the different uh, foods that, they're, uh, that they have as well. So that's, that's something that's really important as well. So we know and have the information to do that. Well, I mean, you can think about Google itself, right? It, it forces you to be curious, not only be curious on step one, but actually be curious on step two, which is researching that word you search for, right? Exactly. And that's such an important thing because before that, the information was held by various gatekeepers, right? Whether that was in book form, but guess what? Our history is not written into those books, right? So for me, it was very important in the pantry section to introduce Benesit, Berbere, et cetera, because now you can research it and guess, now you can also go, where can I find it near me? Exactly. Right? Which then gives that local store or online store an opportunity to level up and, and co commerce with you, right? So this word of what's weird and strange, I, I don't buy into any of that stuff. We've learned it before. We learned how to get the best soy through Japanese culture. We learned about ramen. We learned to be aficionados of that. We learned about Italian food. We can also learn that about food from the African diaspora. Because there's five original cuisines in America that all stemmed out of blackness, right? Low country, southern food, or soul food. You think about Cajun and Creole, and then barbecue. All of these comes out of the black diaspora in some shape or form. And it's important then to know that when you eat barbecue, like, oh, this comes from a place. The way, if I think about American music, blues, funk, hip hop, jazz, gospel, you cannot talk about American music experience and not black culture, it's one. Yeah, and also you mentioned history. So I wanna kind of talk about really a culinary legend as well that you mentioned in your cookbook, Leah Chase, yes. who owned uh, a restaurant in New Orleans. And you mentioned just how she had such an impact on your career and she's even one of the people that you dedicate uh, the rise to. So yeah, tell us more about who is she and the impact that she's had on your life as well. Well, Aunt Leah, she was an amazing chef, an entrepreneur, and Stella runs the restaurant today. The restaurant was open in 1940s, and it's still going 80 years later, right? And that tells you a little bit about family business and generation and keep pushing. But also, you got to think about that time. She's a, she's a black woman in the South running a restaurant for everyone. Yeah. Breaking the law, right? Wow. You know, people, politicians talk about law and order and stuff like that. It's all nonsense because she had to break the law to serve because the laws was that black and white people couldn't eat together. So you think about our history and she still broke, she broke the law, served everybody. She was an activist and an advocate for black art. A lot of the meetings around civil rights movement 
was held in her restaurant, so she took chances mm -hmm. for gatherings. And, um, you know, Leah, for me, is when I think about activism and food, right, which is something that is very dear and close to black culture, um, because so much of our journey was, we were kept away from, from it. Leah is really the hero in that. And uh, there are many black women that raised what we would think about today as crowdfund, but did it their own way in the 50s and 60s and gave the money to the civil rights movement. And my own life, right? I'm here because of two reasons. The civil rights movement gave me the opportunity to come to America and the loss of immigrants, right? So I wouldn't be here otherwise. So for me, it's my duty to broadcast women like Miss Leah Chase. Yeah, it was incredible hearing more about her and other women too throughout the, the cookbook, such as like Cheryl Day, mm -hmm. who uh, you know is a really great baker out of Savannah, Georgia. So definitely enjoyed that. Uh, I want to get a little personal too, uh, because uh, there is a chapter remix, right? And it talks about just the blending of different cultures and recipes and traditions to kind of create this whole new type of uh, recipe or a dish or that sort of thing. And uh, within that chapter, I felt like you got really personal too. You show beautiful photos of your wife and your son and a really great story about how when your wife's sisters come to your home, they kick you out of the kitchen and yeah. <laughs> and start cooking. But uh, just as you mentioned, you know, your background from being born in Ethiopia, growing up in Europe and living here in the US, how are all of those influences not only inspiring what you're doing professionally in the culinary world, but also at home with the family traditions and bonds that, that you're forging moving forward. Yeah, I mean, cooking with Zion, my son, and, and cooking with my wife is always fun. I mean, he loves cooking. He doesn't love eating it. He loves like shopping and, and all the fun stuff, cracking eggs and all that stuff. But when it comes to like big holiday cooking and it goes to the Ethiopian food, I definitely get, I probably like the fifth best Ethiopian cook in my house or something like that. And they like fly in from London or Toronto, like get out. And maybe I can chop onion for them. Uh, but I just love the culture because you, when you talk about black food, so much of our history is oral, right? The rituals of black cooking has been passed down and recipes entered the stage very late. You know, and but the 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 history of a dish like kitsko or warm beef tatar, two thousand years old. Uh, the history of a dish like dorawat, thousands of years old. So, it when you think about the history and the oral traditions, it's also something that makes you it, it's humbling, but it's also rewarding in sense. We're doing this with a higher purpose yeah. to show who we are as a culture and introduce it to our friends and family. Awesome, awesome. Well, the book closes on a lighter note, just talking about all the different sauces and spices that you can make. So just on a lighter, fun note, would love to know what's in your kitchen, what's in your refrigerator or cabinets, the spices yeah. and sauces you can't live without, personally. Well, it, it's a lot because I, it's also a test kitchen for me very often. Um, I always have really good, olive oil and of course basic sort of vinegar, rice wine vinegar and so on, but always interesting spice blends, right? There's a great spice blend from Morocco called El Ras Hanout, which is, means top of the shop, the person who blends it, amazing. Uh, I love uh, a really good five spice, you know, blend, mm -hmm. because and then build on that. Uh, right now I'm testing out um, like a collard green, um, really interesting dry, drying, collard greens with bennis seeds and seaweed uh, for, for it's going to be a powder on top of fish. Wow. There's always a bunch of like tape on stuff, don't touch, and, and dates. And of course, my son wants to open that up because that's fun. Yeah. Well, personally, I love peri-peri sauce, so yeah. I'm excited to try my own. 
Um, but no, that's been great just hearing more about the actual content of the cookbook. I want to actually pivot since you're here, pick your brain on some recipes that we should be cooking on our own as uh, beginner chefs or just as we re read through the book. So I think we actually might have uh, some photos of some of uh, the recipes within uh, the rise. And the first one, I believe it is the cauliflower steak. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, and being vegetarian and, and I think that you don't have to be vegetarian, but like during the pandemic, my wife and I, we, we stopped eating meat and fish for several months and it was great. And I just think that most cultures has sort of, they eat based on a sp spiritual compass, right? So they break fast with a big meat dish, but they also eat a lot of vegetarian food. And this is a great flavorful cauliflower steak uh, with um, mayo that is inspired by jambalaya and the city of New Orleans and uh, Miss Nina Compton. It's a great flavorful dish. And so this is, this is like filling enough, you'd say, or would you recommend pairing it with something else? Yeah, sure. I mean, you can have a cauliflower steak and then you can have some collards with us, some greens, obviously, uh, if you want to fill it out or a little bit lentil underneath or even like a nice turmeric rice, you know. All that sounds good. I'm getting hungry. I'm getting hungry. Uh, all right. So next, I think we actually have a drink. This is the Sea Moss Delight Smoothie. Mm -hmm. So what is this exactly? I was not familiar with sea moss before. Sea moss is one of the healthiest, best foods that I recommend everybody to. Uh, I start very often on mornings with sea moss. Um, super healthy. You find a lot in the Caribbean, in Jamaica, and throughout the Caribbean, actually. You soak it, but you have to wash it because it's of the oceans. That's a lot of sand. Mm -hmm. And then you soak it overnight, and then you can blend it. And it creates a jelly. And that jelly I add into orange juice or anything you want to start your day with. Super healthy, great for your, for your system. And it's just one of those superfoods that is amazing. Nice. And so this is vegan, you were saying, as well? Yeah, absolutely. It's of the ocean. It's, it's seaweed, essentially. Yeah. Nice. All right. I'm going to have to put that on my breakfast. Oh, <laughs> is, it's one of the best things, one of the best, healthiest things that you should, I recommend for everybody. Awesome. Awesome. All right. I think next up we have a little bit of appetizers, the Lego yeah. plantains. So yeah, talk to us about this. This looks I mean, incredible. Lunch us, I mean, so much of street food in Africa, it's you eat on the road, you eat on the go, you go into a market in Lagos or in Ghana or in Ethiopia. Life is outside. It's not inside, right? So you snack like these plantains, a ripe plantain that you fry in a little bit of oil, and then you create the spice mix. Um, in, in Accra, it's called uh, ke Kelewele, and in you, uh, you, you create a, a dip with this. So it's basically plantains that you then toss in this spice rub that has a little bit of heat to it, a little kick to it. Super delicious. Oh man, I love plantains. We eat it almost daily <laughs> in right. my household. So I'm looking forward to trying it. Right recipe as well. So you're already there. That's good. That's yes, good. yes, yes. And also because I know a lot of the recipes uh, are inspired by a certain chef. So who who inspired this this recipe? You know, all the you know, like the book for me was important to broadcast as much incredible black talent as possible. So we have about forty five chefs that we focus on and they tell their stories. Then there's about 200 chefs that are mentioned in the book because very often when it ha what happens to otherism and blackness is up, oh, I don't know how to find anyone in my community. Oh, that would be great if you live in New York or, San or in the Oakland or something like that, but I don't know where to find. I'm like, no, we are everywhere. <laughs> it is ubiquitous. Here are the IG handles. Find them and figure out which one is local and support them, you know, because you know, very often when you plan a book, you plan to think about what are questions that's going to come up, and that I knew would be one. So this is something that I inspired by someone like Eduardo Jordan that went to Lagos and, you know, like Nina Compton before and so on. So. And he's based out of Seattle, so anyone yeah. tuning in in the Seattle area, definitely check out some of his Amazing chef. Yeah. 
Okay, so we're gonna continue our, our journey through some of these great recipes. And I think we're up on an entree next. Uh, so this is uh, the fish cakes, right, with greens? Yeah, Mashama. You know, uh, Mashama is such an amazing chef He's from Restaurant Gray in, in uh, Savannah. And we just had fun cooking with her. And, you know, I think in a year like this, what I've taken away, right, this is the 2020, the year we're all going to tell our grandkids about, right? And they might not even believe the stories, you know. But what I took away was I finished the rides. I started my podcast this moment. And... I met virtually more people right than before we used to meet in person. But through food, through the language of food, I was able to connect. Through the language of storytelling, I was able to connect. And I do think it's very important that we, we're going to be in this for a minute, right? Even when we get the shot, we're yeah. still not going to go back to November, December 2019 right away. Traveling has changed. How we gather has changed. So connecting through food in various different ways is more and more important. Yeah, no, that's so true, so true. So let's go ahead and end with dessert. I think we have coming up next, which is the wine spice chocolate cake. This yeah. looks so good. And you know, we want to do something that happens, right? Like leftover wines, what do I do with it? Now you can create a chocolate cake with it. So just having like being practical and understanding black food doesn't have to be strange or foreign or how do I enter it. And black food is like Italian food. It's not just of one culture for one culture. It, you can be from Sweden and cook black food just like we learned to cook um, French food or lower look, just like we learned to cook Italian food and not be an Italian. So this is a welcoming door in. Yeah, and I think what surprised me about this too was not just that it was wine, but it sounds like there are so many other amazing ingredients in this too. I think it was a little bit of cinnamon and yeah. ginger and orange. It sounds like it will be really, really flavorful. Oh, it has to be delicious. You know, like the <laughs> food, end of the day, if it's not food, people will let you know, you know. But uh, I've had so much fun writing the book and it was fun to broadcast and share other people's stories here. Yeah. And yeah. locally, we've been able to do so many events. Um, and it's, it's important to broadcast this during times like this. It's a very challenging time for our black entrepreneurs in the food space. So starting the fund, Black Business Matters Matching Fund, um, starting the Rise Residence Program. Those are all ways that people can join in and be part of that because uh, we're not out of it, definitely not. Yeah, no, well, I'm excited to do my part and help broadcast and follow you, these amazing, uh, talented people as well. So, Marcus, I actually have one more. I tried one of your recipes over the weekend. It's not as beautiful as these, but we do have a picture of it. Can you guess what it is? I don't know if I if I plated it <laughs> well enough. Oh, no, you definitely did. Uh, uh, you definitely had some shrimp. Uh, this is actually, I think this is Naisha's uh, a curry, right? For the crab boil and the, with the curry? Well, this is actually the gumbo. I tried the gumbo. The, okay, I, nice. I added a little bit of, of crab. I took a, a, a page yeah. the book and said, you know, I'm going to remix it a little bit. Oh, I it's a fancy like that. I see you. I see you. <laughs> My dad makes his gumbo with uh, crab. So in his honor, I said, let me put, let me put some in there. Uh, and I'm, lo I'm loving the plate. It looks amazing. And, and, and the beautiful fabric underneath. Good for you. Yes, it was delicious. So it yeah. was good. Well, just before we take some of our audience questions, because I do want to get to those, uh, as we close, I mean, we, we talked about so much, but I really want to know what brought you the most joy in making the rise? First of all, anytime I get the chance to create a book, I really go back and think about my grandparents and my, and my mentors that got me in this position, my parents. And think about from my grandmother's kitchen, I've been able to work throughout the world and, and share my journey. And then speaking to Leah and speaking to Alberta Wright and the generation that was here before me, but then connecting it with the 
Chiana G's and uh, Patricia Gonzalez. The why we make the bus is to broadcast it, but also for me, share the stories with the young chefs coming up. I want to create content that wasn't there for me when I was coming up, right? Mm -hmm. If I had to look for a cookbook, to ask for a female or for a person of color's cookbook, I knew it didn't even exist, right? And so, of course, I didn't want to lower my dreams or it was highly confusing just to see that every cookbook was French and male. And I'm like, well, that's you know, it's not part of my narrative necessarily. So for me to be able to broadcast the rise and get the journey and the story out throughout the world is what gives me enormous amount of joy. And to think that there is young chefs out there from several places. If you're a non-black chef, here's a learning center. If you're running a company and said, how can we help out and you want to be an ally? Well, here it is, you know what I mean? And then if you're a young a uh, person of color come up like you can look at the rise and say in my community there are other people that look like me i'm entering this my aspiration to be part of this is here right uh and and so it brings me a lot of joy you know that we have this as a jump off point now yeah i mean and i hope we have the rise part two part three yes, part four. Yes, yes. <laughs> you know let's make this just the whole series. I love it. Well, all right. Yeah, let's get to some of the audience questions and see if any have come in. Yes, we have one from uh, Pajo, and he asks, what advice can you give younger chefs that don't have the reputation of yours when exploring new flavors with guests? How did you build the trust of people to try new things? It's a great question. Well, I think for you, keep cooking, keep rising, right? Because when you keep telling your story, whether that's on social media or whether that's on a blog or because it's all, I went to Japan as a teenager, as a 17 year old, won a scholarship. I lived in Switzerland, I lived in France. When you're on those journey, it could be lonely and it's like, what am I doing? But it's all leading up to this moment. So Paju, you're building your menu of life right now and document it because you're going to look back and you can also point at it to like this is what i did three years ago this is what i'm doing right now and here's how i'm building my narrative so the advantage that Pajo has is that people are more open today and people want to know your 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 background story so uh cook just like the way you sing in the shower you know what i mean cook like your best friend and your family is going to eat it don't worry about what other people say, but then also at the same time, learn the craft, study the craft. So have your ideas, but study, there is the right and wrong, so study the craft and then build on your own creativity. Awesome, thank you for that. Let's see if we have another question. We do from David. So David asks, how do you balance staying directly connected to the food at your growing number of restaurants versus building your business and brand, such as giving a platform to other black chefs in the rise? Well, I, I mean, it's not either or for me, right? I think uh, as a chef of color with a large platform, it is my duty to share that and bring people up. And as we have Red Rooster and other chef restaurants, a lot of talent come through that. So opening Red Rooster in Miami, is because we trained someone like Tristan for five years and he's now the chef here, right? So as we build, just like Google, you have talent. It's, I mean, what is Google? It's people, right? And how do those people come talent exactly. and structure and opportunities, right? So it's not either or, it's both. As long as you're curious and passionate and kicking up that door. Like when I will come into that room, that door was, that room is not, for me to be the only one in that room. Amber, for you, it's not the only one. You gotta kick up that door. And if you don't let other Ambers in there, you're missing a big part why you are at that seat, right? That's your opportunity, kick up that door. Exactly, I know there's a saying that says, as you climb, make sure that you're bringing others with you. So definitely resonate with that. All right, any other questions? I think we have one from Katrine, and she asks, how can one best support black cooks when you live 
in an area where there are a few or none? Well, I want to push back a little bit on that because there are people, I don't know exactly where Katrin lives because a lot of black chefs and a lot of people of color, they've been anonymous labor for a very long time. And now we enter a path of visible labor, right? And if you don't know even that Creole comes out of black cooking, if you don't know that barbecue come out of black cooking, then, so that's why it's so important, right? And how can you support? There's many ways to support. Your family can search him, maybe even Google search him. What is a black owned restaurant in my neighborhood? Order out from them. If that's not in the narrow area possible, there's always a way to engage. Most restaurants sell swag today. Buy from that. If you can't just write a check, because everyone can't do that, you have a skill. Like what people don't understand, what kills small businesses, it's not just the one. It's not one thing, it's many drops, right? So mm -hmm. a small, that local restaurant that you really care about, they don't have a social media account manager. They might not even have an accountant. They, you know what I mean? But all of you guys have skills that more than checks, it's a combination of both. I mean, Serge and Larry got checks, but you guys are working. <laughs> you have enormous amount of skills. So if you love that Ethiopia and all that, Haitian restaurant in that neighborhood that is struggling, go over there and say, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna volunteer four hours a month and I'm gonna give my tech skill to that local place. I'm gonna give my marketing skills. Or if you're an accountant, I'm gonna give my accounting skills to that place. And that's how you help, right? No, I love that. It's definitely a diversity of ways to support, not just necessarily purchasing food, but like you said, volunteering or even purchasing swag and i love that it's just something for me and expand on your creativity like we figured out how to do this if this would have been 18 months ago i would have either gone to the new york office or coming to the bay right like coming to um mountain view right right and those are great trips those are amazing right but we figured out how to gather right and you guys are some of the most creative incredible people in the world I know the people are listening can figure out how to support their favorite local BIPOC business. I think so. I think we're up for that challenge. So yeah. we'll see what happens in the next yeah. couple of months. So we do have a few more questions. I want to make sure we get to them. Uh, so Zaid says, thanks for joining. Uh, could you please comment on the challenges facing the restaurant industry and your thoughts of ways out and beyond the pandemic? Well, when it comes specifically to black businesses, you know, one of the reasons why I started Black Business Matters Matching Fund with Uber Eats is because I'm fortunate enough to be able to navigate through this because we have a brand and, and the history of that, but most mom and pops can. So uh, this is the most challenging time in the most, restaurant business is one of the most challenging businesses in the most challenging of times, right? So it's, 41% of black business in general, not just restaurants, have closed due to COVID. And that's massive, right? Because that is savings. Those are ideas, those are identities. Those very, the average of those businesses employ 10 to 12 people. But guess what? That's what a neighborhood looks like. A bunch of mom and pop coming together and, and providing jobs in that local community. So it's a very tough time, but I also think through the worst of times, we've seen the best of times too. We have enormous amount of public-private partnership being started right now. Um, and that gives me a little bit of hope. Yeah, I think you've really seen resiliency too, right? Mm -hmm. Turning uh, to say lemons into lemonade. And it's hard, it's tough, but I think that's been really something that's that's been very inspiring as well, so. All right, let's see if we have another question. One from Vinny. Uh, Salam, chef. What's your favorite fusion of an Ethiopian dish with an American or Swedish one? My family also has all those three cultures combined in it. Vinny, that's the other Ethiopian. Only Google can make that happen. I love it. I love it, Vinny. Well, I'll tell you, um, in Ethiopia, of course, the birthplace of coffee, 
uh, and berbera is a great spice blend. So I would probably say cured coffee smoked salmon. So you, you toast the green coffee and you put Swedish salmon on top. And then you serve it with a bunna, with a coffee mustard sauce with Swedish dill and Ethiopian mustard. Uh, I would say uh, those would be, you know, that would be, that would be it. But even more interesting is I finally found that other Swedopian. <laughs> very cool, very cool. All right, let's see if we have any more. Uh, we do, we do, Samantha. Uh, so Samantha asked, what defines low country food and what makes it uniquely black American? Thank you, Samantha. And uh, you know, I think it's what's great about questions like this is that what's so clear for somebody, it's highly you know, confusing for other people. And I in order to grow, there's gonna be some uncomfort, right? So the low country is really, if you think about the Carolinas, right? And go further in, even to parts of Tennessee, um, and the slave trade really essentially came from West Africa into like a capital that becomes city like Charleston, right? And in that area, so much of the food we consider low country food and food, Southern food as well, came here through the slave trade. Rice, um, okra, so you look at a, a Senegalese jollof rice, and then you think about something like grits like rice grits it's 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 the same dish basically right very similar so much of the food that we consider low country food in that in the carolinas and into tennessee really stems out of west africa but are you still seeing some of those different blendings and the evolution maybe of what might have been considered low country cuisine let's say even 50 years ago is that changing and evolving today as yeah. well. Yeah, I mean, just like you think about hip hop evolved into trap, right? Mm -hmm. Like, of course, people will always move and people will always look at, let me do it this way. And then the food is also based on terroir, right? So, and as our climates are changing, that will change our food, right? So people will never get settled and also how people marry, like you talk about black food and you think about the great migration, right? How African Americans, if you came from Virginia, you majority went up the coast to, to New York, Philadelphia, and Boston. If you came further in, maybe you went up to Detroit through Kentucky and so on, right? But obviously that vastly then changes how the food was being prepped because climate-wise, those places are different. So mm -hmm. we will always evolve. I mean, we went from, again, you think about music, you think about Fela Kuti in the 70s and the 80s, and today you have Burna Boy and Afrobeat, right? This is an evolved experience, but still of African culture for yeah. everyone. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Well, I think we have what's our last question. Um, and this one comes from Luigi. Do you think Afro-Cuban ingredients, uh, ingredients, excuse me, sauces, condiments are largely underrepresented in major food stores? The short answer is yes. <laughs> But I also think that where there are short, where there are opportunities, this is a space that will grow because some of the most incredible food that we like, you think about a jerk sauce, that comes out of that. You think about all the amazing experiences that people travel more, uh, wants to start travel again, I should say, right? People want experience and, and young people enter the space very, very different than their parents the open-mindedness for new things, the curiosity for new things and upload it on social media changes how something before, something like jerk, maybe had to travel distinctly through the Jamaican American community and it still does that way, but it's also broader than that, right? Yeah, and I think too, what you're saying about just supporting some of the smaller businesses, this is an opportunity to get into some of those more local stores too, right? And peruse yeah. their aisles and, 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 and purchase some of those ingredients that way. I mean, stay hungry, stay curious, and keep cooking, keep rising, right? That will get you to a delicious place.
Yes, yes. So actually, I was just joking. We have one more question. So <laughs> want to make sure we don't miss one from David. Uh, in the spirit of Black History Month, who do you think are some historical Black culinary figures who are under-recognized for their contributions to food that we should learn more about? Wow. Thank you for that question. It's a great question. Well, you can start going right back to Thomas Jefferson's heydays. Fanny Nidu, the two young chefs that cooked for him, they were executive chefs, but they didn't have the titles. Mm. Two young women, one was 15 and one was 18. So you talk about in the ingenious, I mean, think about it. you're an executive chef at 15, when did you start to work, right? So I would start there. And then I would think about someone like Sophia Wright that, was the chef for Lyndon B. Johnson. And he trusted her more than any person in Congress. She was his chef and she was a major part how he got the black voting right. Wow. I think about someone like Miss Georgina, that single mother of six, she woke up three o'clock in the morning. So think about when you guys work hard and you think it's tough. Think about this moment. She woke up at three o'clock in the morning to make cakes and she raised hundred dollars a week and gave it to the civil rights movement. Wow. So these are advocates and activists that we, you will not find in the history books. Mm -hmm. it's just, without them, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have this delicious, incredible American stew of food and we wouldn't have each other. So, I mean, diversity wasn't built by Getting here wasn't built by one way, right? It's really, truly a brick house that a lot of people added to. And what the rise does is start acknowledging the authorship that came before us, looking at the present and looking at the future. Yes, and we have so much more to go, so much more to do, and this is a great start. I love it. This has been very inspiring. So I think we're gonna wrap, Marcus. I think that's it, but is I feel like we've covered a lot is there anything else that you feel like we should discuss or hear more? Thank, uh, thank you, Amber. You did a great job and in, in, in cooking over the weekend. And, and uh, but you know, also to Google for staying curious and lending yourself at the company to black questions, not just in the month of February. Absolutely. But don't mind it being in February to so the jump off point but to really living through this experience throughout the whole year because um, it's, it's major companies like Google, it really the, you know, people look up, right, and aspire. And when it happens at Google, it will happen to other places as well. So we thank you for that. Keep yeah. cooking, keep rising. Absolutely. And where can people pick up the rise? I'm going to show it one more time too because it is a beautiful, beautiful book. Well, I mean, there's, you know, first of all, you can follow, you can, Follow me on Marcus Cooks, and then you can really see what type of events we're doing. I would say go to your local indie bookstore or to go, go to Amazon, of course. But if you can support that local bookstore at this moment, it is super important. And, you know, either on Marcus Cooks or, or, or through my podcast this moment, I talk about sort of where, what type of events we're doing and we broadcast the brilliant people that are in the rise and beyond. Love it. Love it. Well, again, we appreciate it. Thank you so much for stopping by. For we hope we see uh, you a fifth time here. So, yes. in person, so we can eat. Oh, my goodness. Absolutely. I agree 100%. Some of Amber's gumbo. Some of Amber's gumbo. <laughs> uh, Sounds good. All right, Marcus. Have a wonderful you. day. Take care. Thank you. Bye.